And so let's take something like limit as x goes to 1 of x squared. And from our informal definition of limit, you could just plug this in. So plug in 1. The limit is x squared as x goes to 1 is equal to 1. No problem. So we know the answer. So in this setup, a is equal to 1 and l is equal to 1. But I want to show you how to use a proof, how to use this definition um, to know that this limit is true. So let's go for it. Let's write down that proof. The way that every one of these proofs starts is by saying that suppose this epsilon bigger than zero has been specified. And you don't know what it is, but someone has specified it, and you know it's bigger than zero. So I'll, write, I'll express that by um, writing down, say that epsilon is bigger than zero. And the, what I need to do is I need to find myself a delta so that this condition holds. And how can I do that? Well, I want f of x minus f of a to be less than epsilon. So I'm going to consider first, I'm going to first consider the distance from f of x to f of 1. And that's the absolute value of, well, what's f of x in this case? Um, in this case, f of x is equal to x squared. So I'm going to get x squared minus 1, absolute value. And I can factor this. So this is absolute value of x minus 1 times x plus 1. Absolute value just takes a quantity and makes it positive. So the absolute value of um, these two expressions multiplied together, that's the same thing as absolute value of x minus 1 times absolute value of x plus 1. OK, so let's set that aside for the moment. I've written now the difference in the y values in terms of a product of x minus 1 and x plus 1. The reason why that's good is x minus 1, that's my x minus a because a is equal to 1. So if I go over here and sort of write down what I want, I want to find delta bigger than 0 so that if x minus a, x minus 1 is less than delta, then f of x minus f of a, that's this expression, is less than epsilon. And how can I do that? Well, if I know that x minus 1 in absolute value is less than delta, then I can go back here to x minus 1 times x plus 1. And I can say, well, this is definitely less than delta. Uh, times x plus 1. And this is the thing that I want to make uh, less than, than epsilon. So the question then is, what do I know about x plus 1? Well, if, if I know that x minus 1 is less than delta in absolute value, that's like the same thing as saying that that negative delta is less than x minus 1, is less than delta. 
And then if I add the number 2 to all three sides, I'm going to get 2 minus delta is less than x uh, plus 1 is less than 2 plus delta. So what I end up with, this is the same thing as saying that the absolute value of x plus 1 is going to be less than 2 plus delta. And so I get to choose a delta that's going to make this be um, less than epsilon. And so how can I do it? So first, since I get to choose delta, whatever I choose it to be, I'm going to choose it to be less than 1. And then something uh, simplifies for me. x plus 1 is now going to be less than 2 plus 1. So x plus 1 is going to be less than 3. So then f of x minus f of a, that's this, is going to be less than delta times 3. And so now I'm almost finished because I want to choose delta in such a way that 3 times delta is less than epsilon, and epsilon is given to me. So I can just choose um, delta to be the minimum of the number 1, because I want it to be uh, less than 1. Or I want it to be less than 1. Well, so I want it to be actually less than 1, so I, might as, I may as well say like minimum of, of 1 half. Because if I choose delta equal to 1, it won't be less than 1. It's kind of technical. So, but, so you want to say maybe minimum of 1 half and epsilon over 3. You don't like seeing that if you're like me and you sometimes get things backwards because you've got epsilon and, and 3 written side by side like that. So if you do that, f of x minus f of a equal to this will be less than 3 delta because you picked delta to be less than 1. And it'll also be less than or equal to 3 delta because you pick delta um, equal to the minimum of the two. And if you want it to be strictly less than, not necessarily less than or equal, then you could just increase this number. You could change that to a 6 if you wanted, so that you'll know that it's strictly less than. So how do you um, take all this arguing and write it into a really clean proof? Now that you know what you want to do, I'll show you how to really clean it up. So say epsilon is bigger than 0. And then you can just immediately choose delta to be the minimum of 1 half and epsilon over 6. And I won't repeat the argument, but then you're going to know that x plus 1 is less than 3. It's less than 3, excuse me. And then what you can do is, following the definition, you can say that if x minus a is less than delta, if x minus a is less than delta, then you're going to know that x plus 1 is less than 3. Then you look at f of x, x squared, minus f of a, that's 1, that's going to be equal to x minus 1 times x plus 1. It's going to be less than or equal to delta times 3. And delta is less than or equal to 
epsilon over 6. So 3 times epsilon over 6. And that's equal to epsilon over 2. And epsilon over 2 is less than epsilon. So that's how you cleanly write a formal proof of the fact that x goes to 1, x squared also goes to 1. And it's kind of a two-step process. What you have to do first is you have to investigate and figure out what's delta going to be equal to. Once you have that information, then you can quickly write down this condition. If delta is equal to this, then so long as x minus a is within um, absolute value of delta, absolute value of x minus a is, is less than delta, then f of x minus f of a in absolute value will be less than epsilon. So that's how to argue that.